I'm really thrilled today and, and honestly quite honored to, to be joined by a very special guest uh, who is somebody that I have followed and, and really learned a lot from, uh, you know, this is all moving very quickly, but uh, over, over a period of months. And that's Connor Grennan. And uh, Connor is an expert. You know, he's not just an expert in the field of AI, um, but he's also dean of the business school uh, at the NYU Stern School. Uh, and heads up the generative AI at Stern, which uh, I want him to dive into a little bit more. Uh, and and I'll, I'll read the quote, and then maybe you can comment on that, Connor. It's an initiative lighting the path to AI fluency for students, faculty, and administrative sh- administration alike without getting too tangled in the technicalities. Um, so I love that dis- description. Maybe you could start there, if you wouldn't mind, giving us a little bit more background on that and you know, kind of what led you down this path of, of AI and AI at Stern. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's great to it's great to talk to you. So, uh yeah, so I've been the dean of MBA students at at NYU Stern for the last uh decade or so and it was really only this year that the generative AI I, I started the generative AI program. Uh that started because uh my wife is in AI at McKinsey. Uh she uh does responsible AI over there uh, at the consulting firm and so in the beginning of the year she was telling me about uh, chat GPT and everything and sort of saying, Hey, you should really look into this and get involved in this. And I did and found it to be a huge disruption right away. Uh, and, you know, decided, okay, we need an initiative to teach our MBA students, uh, this and very quickly found out that probably the whole school faculty, right. The administration, probably everybody, uh, needed it. And that sort of took me down this path of really building out frameworks and then ultimately working with other companies around that. But that was really the, uh, the impetus around starting that to begin with. Well, that's great. And yeah, um, again, following you and I had an opportunity to attend a few of your workshops as well, or your master classes. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, we, we have the benefit of talking to, you know, literally hundreds of different clients and organizations and sales leaders in the industry. And I tried to collect some of the questions, some of the common themes we're hearing, but one of them is really the trade off between is this just about automation and efficiency? Or is there really something more here? And I know you've you've written and, and spoke about the idea of curiosity, right? And how we need to use this as a tool to kind of unlock the potential. Can you say a little bit more about that? And what do you think we're missing on the side of just, hey, we can, you know, uh, send more uh, scripts to prospects or or we can speed up that front end process? You know, what what are we missing there from a sales perspective? Yeah, I think it's such an interesting question. And, you know, it actually goes right to the fact that this is both, you know, generative AI. I mean, and when I say generative AI, I mean, obviously, the large language models like ChatGPT and, you know, Claude and Bing and Bard, things like that. And also uh, image generation. That's sort of what we mean by when we say uh, generative AI. But it's funny, right, Ray, because it's it's both the easiest thing in the world to use and the hardest thing in the world to use, right? Because the easiest, because you need absolutely zero technical training. Like, I mean, zero. Like, the only thing you need to know how to do is to be able to speak like a human, which everybody is great at. Everybody's speaking like a human. So, and there's less than zero technical things. It literally, the same amount of technical skill you need to use Google, you need to use this. You need to know how to type into a, a chat window. But I love the question around where is this taking us and why is it sort of, you know, tricky, right? So, uh, because I think a lot of people in the here AI, their mind does go to what you're talking about, kind of, you know, automating tasks and things like that. And I don't really go to that. I don't go to the automation of tasks because, you know, certainly if something's low level enough, I mean, you're talking about a customer service chatbot for American Airlines or something like that. Right. That's very good because it's just taking in a query and going and searching for uh, information. But in sales, certainly it'll do exactly what you're talking about. It will help you, you know, speed up uh, with writing and everything like that. But it really does go a lot deeper and everybody's at a different stage on this but if you've already kind of you know graduated from that level of you know speeding up some of the more menial tasks what this is is also a phenomenal thought partner but i even kind of want to take a a step back from that and think you know why or how does this really work and here's what's so interesting about that about i think the question that you're getting to which is you know, how do we really use this? Is it an automation? What is it? And the reason why I think this is hard to use uh, is, you know, 
AI has always been in a tight user interface in the past. So you think about, you know, spell check or something like that. Those are AIs, Grammarly, things like that. Those are AIs, but you don't see any AI. You just know that it's helping you in whatever process you're trying to do. What this is doing is really taking the user interface off and allowing you to use, you know, anything, you know, to, to use it for anything you have. It's sort of a solution without a problem. And I think the reason people get sort of tied up or maybe intimidated about using it in the first place is, you know, with everything else, it, sort of Salesforce or something like that, it tells you exactly what you're doing, what you're replacing, what you're, uh, you, you used to use this and now you use this. And what generative AI is so outstanding at is actually augmenting what you do well. So it takes, or even things that you don't know how to do. And so if you can imagine an analogy between uh, going back in time and showing people a light bulb and saying, hey, you know, they'll know exactly how to use that. But if you go back in time and show them electricity, they may say, how do you use that? And you might say, well, it depends on what you're doing. You know, are you trying to heat your house or cool your house or build a flywheel or churn butter or right. it really depends. And so that's what, you know, when, when you're talking about sales, there's so many different elements of sales. And so generative AI is outstanding at augmenting what you are trying to do do but that's sort of where you kind of graduate to yeah and, and i think it really is that mindset shift right is is thinking differently about it and i think it, it relates to another question that that we've heard which is you know people don't trust it right so so they're worried about you know hallucinations and they're worried about the accuracy and and other issues which we'll get to um, but also about you know maybe automating or taking over their jobs right sales is going to be obsolete and it just goes mm -hmm. away so how do we help with the adoption around that curious mindset and using it more as a tool because i mean it's a game changer and we've seen it in our in our sales training programs where we integrate it and the light bulb does go on you know to continue your analogy um and to see oh i can have it not only help define my persona but now i can tailor the message specific to my product and that can or that uh, target that i'm going after and help me with the language and prepare for objections and everything else. So that's great. But how do you get past that maybe initial resistance and help with that adoption piece? Yeah. I mean, listen, this is the big question, right? Because so I'll, I go on, as you sort of referenced in the beginning, I train uh, companies on how to use generative AI, train teams on how to use generative AI. And one of the first things I go to is exactly that question, which is, you know, is this scary. Is this going to replace your job? And what I would say is, you know, it's it's not going to replace your job. Now, I can't say that for everything, but it really depends. Again, if we forget about the tool for a second and just think about you and me and what we do, right? A job is made up of very specific tasks. So if your job is just one specific task, say it's data entry or something like that, then potentially, or if it's just data analysis, very simple data analysis, then if if AI, you know, generative AI especially, will first augment that task, there will come a time where it could probably replace that task. But that's where the human comes into it. And I'm guessing people who are interested in you know listening to you right. really have a more complex roles. And when you break down your job into individual tasks, because a job is not one big monolithic thing, it is a series of tasks that that person does. And what I really encourage people to do is instead of being, you know, afraid of this, which, you know, we can understand and everything like that, but just start, you know, break down your tasks into discrete uh, things, almost like a, make a list of it. And then take that list and apply generative AI, ChatGPT, for example, to each one and see how it does. And I think what people will find is that, holy cow, like, you know, if I'm trying to add value to, you know, either just my small startup or my big company, whatever it is, and let's be honest, right, like, I'm not talking about helping, I mean, on the grand scale, I'm talking about helping companies, but I'm talking about helping the individual <laughs> because if the individual is being helped, the company is going to be helped. But people won't do this if they don't see the benefit to themselves. And so what I talk about is if you can you know, reduce the amount of time that you spend, say from 60% down to 30% on some of the more menial tasks, we can talk about what the best things to use it on are, of course, but then all of a sudden it frees up, let's say, I don't know, two or three hours in your day to really work on the big issues that's first of all going to really move you ahead, move your small company ahead, or, and again, let's just be honest, impress your team, impress your boss. I mean, you'll be able to move ahead very, very quickly because what this does is it speeds up 
literally the speed, and improves the quality of the work on those jobs. That's number one. Number two on hallucinations, just real quick. Yeah. You know, the reason why we run into hallucinations is that it's a really understandable problem why people run into it. It's because, you know, when the brain sees something like ChatGPT, because the brain is so good at pattern prediction, automation, things like that, your brain assumes that this is something like Google. It, the brain needs to sort of see something that's never seen before here, and it has to figure out what is this replacing? What is this, you know, the new version of? So we think Google. But if you use something like ChatGPT, like Google, you are going to hit hallucination after hallucination because it is it is much better as a reasoning tool than a knowledge tool. Now, in recent days, this technology is shifting very, very quickly. Right. And now ChatGPT is connected to the internet. It can actually probably answer those questions better. But if you need precision, you're about to talk to a client and you need to connect with that client on something that that client knows... That is where you want to use Google. You need precision. But if you want to understand, hey, this is generally who this person is, what sort of techniques, what would appeal to this person? Like what, like if I'm going to this audience or this audience or this audience, what are the different ways that I can approach that? What are some ideas? That's what I mean by reasoning and hallucination. So when people say, well, I don't want to use it because it hallucinates, it's because we're using it in a way that it's not meant to be used. It's understandable why, but it's the wrong way to use it. Right, right. Yeah. And newsflash, uh, 100% of everything on the internet is not accurate and truthful, right? So it's only pulling that information. But I think it's exciting when we can start looking at a, our own data lake or our, our own environment, where we can now train it on that information and feed it our playbook and feed it information about our client, or even just taking a 10k and saying, hey, can you interpret? can you review this? Now you have accurate information and actually like Claude and others, I think, do, do that pretty well where you can, you know, literally just drop a, a PDF in there and have it look at or, or having a, a PDF plug in uh, that you're using. So, no, I think that's fantastic. What are you seeing just building on that theme, but around like AI playbooks and AI training and and really helping to codify that within an organization? Because it's an area we're getting a lot of interest and we're packaging up as well. Let's, you know, actually define what those use cases are across your sales process and let's give some sample prompts that they can pull from it's not exhausting but it you know gives some ideas to prime the pump but what else are you seeing that you know kind of helps enable the sales team yeah no I, I think that's a great point right because people need to know how to use it what drives me a little bonkers is the people who are really really good at using generative AI are still, I think, giving bad advice to others on how to use generative AI. It's just what I've seen, which is why I do, which is why I built my own uh, framework around this. And my framework is really, it got away from how to use the tool and it gets much deeper into how do you work, right? So for example, I may walk into a, uh, you know, organization, let's say I walk into a, you know, a healthcare organization or a marketing organization. And one of the first questions I'll get is, well, how does this apply to healthcare? And my answer is always, well, you're going to tell me how it applies to healthcare because what really like it has to sort of augment what you do. So sometimes if I'm giving use cases around this, people will take that as, oh, I see, because that's how the brain works. The brain is looking for, you know, this is something different. How do I use it? And use cases sometimes, you know, put us in a little box and they're getting use cases from somebody, you know, like me who, you know, I know sales a little bit just because I've worked with some sales organizations, you know, around training on ChatGPT. But the real power comes when I say to somebody, well, tell me what you do during the day. Like, let's talk about this. What are some big challenges? What are some things that are just on the back burner because you can't possibly get to them because you're busy putting out fires? Like, what are those things? And I'll hear the person say, well, it's really doing something like that. And I will essentially kind of like, you know, in a live in a demo right there in front of 200 people say, let's talk to ChatGPT about it. And I'll literally just put in what they are saying. People think that you need some complicated prompts right it's just not true i don't even do prompt engineering and the reason is because it it tends to sort of put a barrier up because people think they have to prompt it in air quotes in a certain way now prompting is great in coding and and more sophisticated things and getting rubrics and certainly in sales for sure but i think and we can talk about some of the examples in sales but i think that uh, maybe we go to that there next uh, but I think that really the, the thing is, is if you just understand how you work and what you do, that's going to be the best way to use ChatGPT. No, it's a, it's a fantastic perspective. And I think, you know, your earlier comment about freeing up time. I and mean, if we can, you know, if you really were analyzing an annual report and, and a 10K, you know, that, that could take some time. You know, even if you're just focusing on the management discussion, diving into that. 
Well, if we can do that now in about five minutes and have it suggest here are the things you should know if you're a salesperson calling on the chief technology officer, given this this recent report, that frees you up. And as you were saying that earlier, I, I was thinking about and I'm a big fan of in Adela at Microsoft, right? Of course, huge investment yeah. into uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT. And, you know, he said the promise is not that it's going to automate and take over the jobs. The promise is it removes the mundane and those repetitive tasks and frees us up to do those things that humans do better, which is be curious and think about those connections and tie it together. And, you know, to me, at least that that's a nice promise that uh, it, it can help make us better salespeople. And I've, I would say, you know, having talked to hundreds of sales leaders over the last 10 plus years, I haven't met one who didn't say, oh, I wish we were, I, I wish we didn't uh, do such a great job planning for our calls, or I wish we didn't, you know, ask so many questions and understand our customer. It's always the opposite, which is, oh, we jump to the demo too quickly and we really don't understand how this company makes money or the business need. And in my mind, those are real life examples where, hey, a few good queries and, and you're off to the races. I mean, 100%. I think on your first point about, you know, automating the mundane and it's it's you know probably near automation i think sometimes people think that you press a button and something's done it's more that it speeds it up sometimes i think of it like when you're going to the airport you start off at your house and you're in a car so you're zipping along and then you're walking to the jetway and some of it you have to walk and then sometimes you hit those moving walkways like there's just bits and pieces that just move you along much much faster and you have sort of have to figure out what those are in in chat gpt but i also totally agree in in sales uh, you know, and everybody essentially is in sales of some kind, right? I mean, like sometimes it's a little more uh, explicit that you're literally in sales. But what I work on with with sales all the time, it is literally one of the most powerful cases in, you know, using ChatGPT for this very specific reason. Uh, so I have a sort of a three-part framework that I use. But in the early part, one of the things is, you know, how to understand the different things that, for example, you're pitching or selling. And, you know, humans tend to be kind of bad at decisions because we tend to use our, you know, our cognitive bias tends to lean us in one direction or another based on the, let's say you're weighing two things, the thing that you understand more. And you're just, if with that cognitive bias comes, you know, more likely that you will pitch that product for a very human reason is that, you know, if you're asked about the one that you don't understand very well, you won't really be able to sound, you won't sound so confident, you know, so you sort of end up pitching this, which leads to then, of course, bad decision making because you're weighing them uh, unequally. And that's really, really critical. So as we see, it's not really about the tool. It's about how humans think about what our brain does and how this can get us through that. And the other reason that this is incredible, uh, ChatGPT and, and other tools like this is sort of like your, what you're referencing, understanding your clients. And so I was working with, for example, a uh, a private equity shop around, uh, you know, that was focused in healthcare and we were talking about value-based care. You know, we started off sort of saying like, okay, so let's make sure that we all understand it. ChatGPT is phenomenal at, at explaining this in a million different ways. But then importantly, if you're pitching something like value-based care in healthcare, it doesn't even really matter if we understand what that is or not. We just have to know that it's going to, the pitch of value-based care is going to sound very different to a hospital executive, to an insurance, uh, you know, a hospital executive who's concerned with profit and loss, to an insurance uh, executive who's concerned about risk, and to a patient who's concerned about how they are being or how their mom or dad or whatever is being taken care of. I mean, those are very, very different audiences. And what this does very, very well is just create even you do have to tweak it. You never want to sort of like take something wholesale, but it gives you instantly uh, you know, sort of like different pitches for different people. The other thing I'll just kind of like jump into just for one second here is yeah. about how uh, it, it can create what I like to call infinite focus groups. I mean, you can literally say, mm. because ChatGPT is better at sounding like a human than it does anything else. And so what I like to do is say, hey, you know, uh, let me walk into a uh, grocery store in, you know, Kansas, and I want to talk to five people, different you know demographics, all of whom have an interest in buying yogurt that day. And you can actually literally, like kind of, again, air quotes, read their minds and find out what are they looking at when they see this? What are they thinking? And then you can go in and say like, hey, can you ask, uh, you know, Juan over there, you know, why is he choosing this? I see that he's a 52-year-old dad of uh, three little girls. Or you can sort of say like, hey, here's a 26-year-old, uh, you know, Sherry, who's the, and it's an amazing way of getting instant feedback you can do that over and over again because ChatGPT and these other tools are outstanding at understanding how humans think and why they make the decisions that they do. 
Well, and it's such a practical, uh, you know, application to say, okay, let's let's try this out or let's see how it fits. And that was one of the things that really struck me in in your workshops is literally just jumping into the tool and say, let's try this out, right? And yeah. and let's show. And and we've been doing more and more of that. You know, one of the things that when people think AI kind of in in quotes, they're thinking about, oh, I've got to install, you know, some third party app or I'm I'm I've got to have this technology and this automation and even for things like role playing. And, you know, we found it does a fantastic job of just saying, hey, I'm calling on this guy who's dean of the MBA students, you know, and I'm preparing and here's his LinkedIn profile. You can feed that in. You know, how should I think about this interaction or, you know, more specific in a sales environment? What concerns is the CFO going to have about this SaaS uh, offering that we put together? Here are the components. And guess what? They're having a down quarter. What objections is is that person going to have? Can you role play those with me? Oh, and also don't go easy on me, right? You know, be a little bit rough and and I want to respond and and help me out. I mean, now you're actually talking, like you said, it it, it feels like you're talking to a real human or a real mentor, right? And and you're getting that input. It's an outstanding use case. It really is. And I, as you sort of said, this is what I try to do in the in the workshops too, just to sort of like show people exactly how it is because it thinks differently every time it doesn't have sort of like one library of answers it's thinking based on the input that you're giving it and the more input that you can give it about hey here's this person's linkedin profile or hey here's the product that i'm trying to sell and here's the person i'm trying to sell it to what objections might come up what you know and and i love the don't go easy on me you can sort of say like okay go a little easier on me or like always just keep pushing back keep saying no like and you can sort of train your salespeople or even train yourself to do that art of negotiation it's absolutely phenomenal phenomenal at training you on negotiation because it, it's it's a very safe place. Why do we not like to practice things, right? We don't like to practice things because practice hurts. You know, it hurts our brain. It hurts our ego, everything else. But what this does is it puts you in a very safe environment by which you can practice, for example, the art of negotiation and keeping your heart rate low, right? I mean, like practicing negotiation often has very high stakes or it feels very fake. You're either doing it in, you know, an MBA class or something like that, or you're doing it to try to buy a car. And those are very, you know, sort of like, you know, in a way, like one is fake and the other is really high stakes. And if you can do it sort of in an environment, for example, do sales pitches, do negotiations, do all these things in a world where you know that this thing just wants the best for you, but it's also going to give you phenomenal feedback the results are going to be extraordinary and sort of like leads you to be uh, better prepared for when it really matters. Oh, and, and again, a, a great example. And we, we always joke in our workshops, you know, if you're not practicing in a safe environment, you're practicing on your client. <laughs> and that's a really expensive way to do training, right? You don't get enough of those at bats. And, you know, the poor manager is like, well, I always have to step in and take over. And I'm like, well, what do you do the 95% of the time when you're not there? So yeah. we need to get ahead of that. Well, yeah, what if we have some scenarios that they walk through on their own and then they go to their manager and say, hey, I've nailed this or record it. Right. And yeah. and record a video. And, you know, in the future, you'll be able to have that that video critiqued as well. Or you can, depending on the app. So I think that's great. But let's talk more about the managers and the leaders. Um, you know, and I know you speak to, to CEOs and executive groups. And some of the things we hear is, you know, they're concerned about confidentiality. They're concerned about privacy. They're not sure, hey, as soon as I put that in, does it get exposed to the Internet? And, and now I've uh, you know, given away the keys uh, to, mm -hmm. to the shop. So, you know, what's the reality of how they should think about this? And I guess they need to coach and train their reps on what's appropriate and what isn't. I know that could be a whole nother podcast, but can you share a little bit of what you've, you've heard and, and run into along that? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, um, you know, it's a real issue, right? Data privacy is, is one of the big reasons, uh, why people are afraid to use this, which is interesting, right? And, and I get it sort of anytime you're dealing with a new beast here, so to speak, uh, you know, you're going to be a little more, uh, careful and that's understandable. Now that tends to sort of, you know, the pendulum swings sort of wildly the other direction because, you know, all these companies that, you know, make money. Their profit and loss comes from because they know how to manage risk, uh, but have sort of, you know, kind of like really uh, sort of, you know, uh, circled the wagons, so to speak, and, and aren't sort of taking those risks in, in using it. However, risk is real, right? So, um, so what, you know, if you have the big issues tend to be around, are you violating third party agreements? Are you, uh, you know, uh, in healthcare, you know, HIPAA in law, there's obviously legal things in finance, you know, you don't want to be uploading a lot of your data. Now, here's the thing that I want to just sort of like level set on it, though. 
is that I think, you know, the Samsung uh, case that came out in, in March, there was a case where the, not a case, but just a big news story where Samsung, uh, you know, coders or whatever, like uploaded a lot of proprietary data. And it just made the news and everybody kind of freaked out and said, oh, those idiots, how could they? But I think what it did right. is it made everybody else think, oh, I better not upload anything. When that's just not the case. I mean, a lot of things, most of what we talk about, it's not proprietary, it's just reasoning. And also, I don't mind putting my own financial, personal financial data up into it because I get a lot of information out. And do I really care if somebody knows how much I'm spending on a car payment? No, I don't care. Now, again, the big challenges are around if it's third party. By the way, everybody's risk tolerance uh, is different around that. But I also do want to say that if you have been in a position where you've uploaded something and it's eating away at you because now you think somebody else has it, it doesn't work like that. It's not like if you upload your company secrets, you've left it on the table in Starbucks and somebody now has come along and taken it. It's just not how the system works. The system will have worked by you know processing all that data and seeing, oh, here's how words fit together. Here's how people talk. It doesn't go into some repository that somebody else can take down. Now, why do we have to be careful with it? Again, because uh, you know it can violate uh, you know sharing with a third party, a lot of uh, legal agreements, and also technically around you know anything connected to the cloud or the internet, you have to be careful. Technically, yes, OpenAI people would have access to that. Uh, data. Now, OpenAI people have access to billions and billions of documents at this point. So why yours? Because again, I could work for, I don't know, JP Morgan or something like that, or or I could just say I worked for JP Morgan and uploaded something and they wouldn't, they wouldn't know. So if you already have done something like that, you can rest easy. It's totally fine, but you do want to be careful about just uploading things that you would not really want people to necessarily overhear uh, on the street. Yeah, and, and a great way to characterize it, because I think that's where there is a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? That, oh, my goodness, you know, we can't do anything, but it is, it's kind of the drop in the ocean analogy, I think, and not even exposed directly. But if, it, if you have client confidentiality, the GDPR, as you mentioned, or HIPAA kind of thing, whether or not that's exposed or not, you, you may be breaking some agreement that you have in place. So I think that's where we do need some guardrails, right? And we need... Though that playbook or those guidelines to say, well, no, you're not going to do this, or you need a private instance where you're now publishing your own information and it's not exposed. So I, I think yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, there's and there are new tools coming out all the time. Again, this this technology is developing so fast that it's getting more and more private by the day. Yep. Well, let's shift gears a little bit, and I, I want to be sensitive to our time, but um, I know, and and you did a demo again. I I, I saw uh, you post on on LinkedIn about some of the language capabilities. And was was really mind blowing. But I'm thinking about an international sales team, and we always have the challenge of well, we've got you know people spread out globally, we've got different regions, we've got different language, and we're trying to train them. And so maybe we have a series of videos and then some live sessions. But can you talk about how that evolves in terms of maybe global sales and culture and, and linguistics and um, you know some of the developments there, and then we'll get into some of the other you know new features or cool things that you're seeing. It's, the language stuff is unbelievable. And these are, you know, generative AI tools. And essentially, uh, I think one is called UGen, and that's a that's a big one. And essentially, you just upload a video of yourself speaking. I could be uploading this one right now, for example, and it will translate it into, you know, I, I don't know how many languages it is, but it's definitely like, you know, German, French, uh, I think Hindi. There's a bunch of languages it translates it into. But here's the thing. It doesn't translate it like a new sort of synthetic voice. It sounds, and I've tested this, it yeah. sounds like me. The tone is like me. It changes slightly the movement of my mouth so it looks like I'm talking. It is absolutely mind-bending. These are tools that cost probably, I mean, there's you know, there's a free version, but it's not good. But these tools cost maybe $40 a month. I mean, for what you're getting, if you have a global sales team or if you have a training video or something and you you know really want you know, you are a voice to train people because that's what comes across, especially if you're in sales and you're in a leadership role. My guess is that you're an excellent communicator. And so you really want to communicate in your voice and into all these different, certainly uh, European based uh, languages, but also uh, languages getting more and more global by the minute. It is an absolutely incredible tool. And I really encourage people to even just to look at the demos, because as you're talking about that's something that people have to do. So go find the AI tool for that. You don't just grab a random AI tool. That's super practical. 
Well, and I, I had one of my colleagues who's a German speaker uh, review your video. I say, hey, what do you think? He said, actually, this German's pretty good. <laughs> so <laughs> and I don't think you speak German, right? Zero. I mean, zero. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's a huge endorsement. And especially compared to the the robot voice or, or a synthetic mm-hmm. generated, which is kind of what, what we're used to or what we expect. Yeah. Um, so that's fantastic. What other applications are you excited about? I know you keep, you know, pretty, pretty close finger on the pulse of, of what's emerging and trying out new tools. So what do you see and maybe specifically related to, if you can think about a sales team, but what's coming or what should we be uh, keeping an eye on? Yeah. I mean, listen, here's the thing, right? So, and I, I do a lot of this as you sort of referenced on, on LinkedIn, I try to post every day uh, around the new stuff that I'm seeing or understanding or anything like that. The, you know, the latest stuff is really around what they call multimodal. And that just means that, you know, something like ChatGPT, you can now uh, talk to it and talk back. Uh, it will talk back. That's phenomenal. It just kind of like speeds things up. Uh, the big thing for me uh, and the big thing probably for the world is ChatGPT Vision, for example, which is outstanding. I'm using it all the time. Basically, you just take a photo of something. So, for example, uh, I was giving some examples of this the other day, but yeah. I was having trouble with literally a program on my laptop. I couldn't, you know, when you're trying like a new video thing or, you know, something we're on right now, for example. And it's just like you can't figure it out. I literally take a photo of it and I say to ChatGPT, like, hey, I'm trying to figure this out. What should I do? And it's like, okay, go into settings. It's amazing as opposed to sort of like trying to explain where you are or what you're doing or something like that. So anything that you're like just having trouble with, you literally take a photo and say, hey, can you help me with that? And that's phenomenal, especially I think in sales and things like that, when you really have to have a deep understanding of whatever it is you're trying to pitch or sell or something, and you're probably doing a lot of research on the latest stuff. I use it a lot because certainly something like chat PDF or there's PDF tools, PDF readers within ChatGPT and elsewhere that will help you synthesize uh, a lot of material, you know, spit out insights. But then there's always those charts which look amazing, but you don't totally get it. And, you know, with vision, what this can do is you literally take a photo of the chart and just say, hey, can you explain what this is? I saw it like a 54 line uh, regression model, which I was just, you know, my, my head was spinning around it. And it's like, hey, this is what this is. You just take a photo of it and it explains it to you. So I think really in the in the research function, for sure, it's phenomenal. And just remember that these tools are changing every day. So find the people that, it doesn't have to be me, but just find somebody that you like, especially on LinkedIn, that's going to sort of just keep you up to date and translate all this stuff for you because there is just so much happening. Yeah, it's it's really exciting. And it is. I, I learn every day in the use cases, the practical. I can't remember if it was yours or somebody else took a picture of their bike and said, I'm having trouble adjusting the seat or something. Yeah, yeah. And it broke down, you know, knew that specific bike, knew the tools you needed, knew the size of the Allen wrench. And it's like, OK, that that is a very practical. Now apply that to sales or to your organization. Right. Exactly. So that's great. All right. Two more questions. I'll let you go. We'll we'll, we'll kind of take the, the negative side and then and end on a high note. But um, can you share any instances of where AI adoption hasn't gone well? Like what are the biggest challenges or, you know, where maybe organizations are really struggling? Um, you know, what's going on and, and, and what are the, the problems you're seeing? So I think that the, the biggest thing I see is that um, one of two things, people just sort of not what you're waiting and saying, OK, yeah, this is going to be a priority, you know, maybe uh, in the early part of next year. This is happening now. And I mean, and your competitors right now are using this to get ahead. And it's in a, in a hard way that's very hard to track. So in terms of the negative things that companies, I think, are not doing, uh, it there's some hesitation there. There's also when people are looking to figure this out, what they tend to do is they tend to maybe turn to the people who are using it well. But there's a big difference between using it well and understanding how to explain it to others. I, get, I know because for months I was really botching the way that I was trying to train people because I didn't in the early days because I didn't realize how complex it is and how much it involves like how we think and everything like that. So I think it's very easy to feel like you're making progress, but then for people to just not be using it because they haven't had that sort of change management, that sort of behavioral change that you really need to understand that. So I think that that's some of the big, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges around companies adopting it. Yeah, no. And I think it, it really calls out a disparity. And we saw this, we, we did a sample of a, one of the live cohort sessions we were doing a large audience and said, you know, how comfortable are you today? And a very large percentage either weren't using it or didn't really know what to do with it. Yeah. But over 90% said they wanted to and they thought that it was going to impact their job in the next 
12 months. So it's like, oh, okay, there's a there's a disparity. Only 6% of those organizations actually had some sort of training or formal AI program in place. So I think there's lots of opportunity, but we do need to make it, you know, very practical and, and tangible for them uh, yeah, to, to start using it. But it, it's something that I, I feel really strongly about is we can't wait until it's perfected, until we got everything figured out because it's changing too quickly. And those who figure out just how to use it in their everyday sales motion are going to be more effective and, and I think are going to get ahead of the game. No question. So if, if you had to leave our sales leaders and revenue leaders, you know, our, our audience with kind of one takeaway about integrating AI into their organization, um, you know, making it more effective, what, what would you say to the, those sales leaders? Yeah, I think the, the the first thing is to understand, you know, if you lead a department, um, you have to understand the capabilities of it, right? So you have to get even some kind of basic training or something to see the capabilities. And why is that important? It's important because then you'll understand what the new benchmark is for your people. If it's just, if it's left at the hands of just sort of anybody doing this, they'll either choose to do it or they won't. Now, salespeople tend to be a little more driven uh, than sort of like a lot of other people because like a lot rests on whether they're doing something well, as opposed to somebody who's just sort of showing up at work and being able to go home. But I think that sort of starting at the top of the organization, really understanding what the capabilities are is huge because then that immediately changes what your benchmarks are, what you know that people can accomplish in one day. So I think that's huge. And the second thing is we kind of touched on it earlier, but take your job and break your job into tasks, understand what you're doing, and then start applying it to each one. And when I say applying it, literally just tell ChatGPT what you're doing. It doesn't require, uh, you know, uh, complicated prompts or anything like that. And then ask, ask it, well, how else can you help? And just remember things like, you know, it's great at communication. It's great at decision making. It's great at helping you think through things. And the more you use it, the more use cases you will come up with because you're the expertise. And all this really does is augment you. It augments your expertise. That's the real power behind it. No, it's fantastic. And yeah, I, I think the remembering to do it piece and and it's also something we're looking at is how do you train the managers to be able to coach better? And the leaders to better, you know, appreciate and reinforce because it needs to come, like you said, top down and throughout the organization. One of the biggest challenges is we've seen people, the light bulb goes on, they're excited. And then by next week, they've forgotten, right? They're, they're like back into their, their routine. So that's right. Well, Connor, it's been a fantastic uh, discussion and I always learn a lot. And uh, again, I appreciate following and, and, and all of your insights, um, you know, Hope we can continue the conversation. I'm sure we could spend a lot, lot longer here today. But again, I just wanted to thank you uh, for for all you're doing for the industry and for spending time with us today. Thanks, Ray. It's great to be here. I love the conversation. All right, thank you. Take care.